This is a reading from the mystical city of God, the Incarnation, by Venerable Mary of Agrida. Chapter 10. Christ our Savior is born of the Virgin Mary in Bethlehem, Judah. 468. The palace which the Supreme King of Kings and the Lord of Lords had chosen for entertaining his eternal and incarnate Son in this world was a most poor and insignificant hut or cave to which most Holy Mary and Joseph betook themselves after they had been denied all hospitality and the most ordinary kindness by their fellow men, as I have described in the foregoing chapter. This place was held in such contempt that though the town of Bethlehem was full of strangers in want of night shelter, none would demean or degrade himself so far as to make use of it for a lodging. But there was none who deemed it suitable or desirable for such a purpose, except the teachers of humility and poverty, Christ our Savior and his purest mother. On this account, the wisdom of the Eternal Father had reserved it for them, consecrating it in all its bareness, loneliness, and poverty as the first temple of light. Malachi chapter 4, verse 2, Psalms uh, chapter 111, verse 4. And as the house of the true Son of Justice, which was to rise for the upright of heart, from the resplendent Aurora Mary, turning the night of sin into the daylight of grace. 469. Most Holy Mary and St. Joseph entered the lodging thus provided for them, and by the effulgence of the 10,000 angels of their guard, they could easily ascertain its poverty and loneliness, which they esteemed as favors, and welcomed with tears of consolation and joy. Without the delay, the two holy travelers fell on their knees and praised the Lord, giving him thanks for his benefit, which they know had been provided by his wisdom for his own hidden designs. Of this mystery, the heavenly princess Mary had a better insight, for as soon as she sanctified the interior of the cave by her sacred footsteps, she felt a fullness of joy which entirely elevated and vivified her. She besought the Lord to bless with a liberal hand all the inhabitants of the neighboring city, because by rejecting her, they had given occasion to the vast favors which she awaited in this neglected cavern. It was formed entirely of the bare and coarse rocks, without any natural beauty or artificial adornment, a place intended merely for the shelter of animals. Yet the Eternal Father had selected it for the shelter and dwelling place of his own Son. 470. The angelic spirits, who, like a celestial militia, guarded their queen and mistress, formed themselves into cohorts in the manner of court guards in a royal palace. They showed themselves in their visible forms, also to St. Joseph, for on this occasion it was befitting that he should enjoy such a favor. On the one hand, in order to assuage his sorrow by allowing him to behold this poor lodging, thus beautified and adorned by their celestial presence, and on the other, in order to enliven and, and encourage him for the events which the Lord intended to bring about during that night. And in this forsaken place, the great queen and empress, who was already informed of the mystery to be transacted here, set about cleaning with her own hands the cave, which was soon to serve as a royal throne and sacred mercy seat. For neither did she want to miss this occasion for exercising her humility, nor would she deprive her only begotten son of the worship and reverence implied by this preparation and cleansing of his temple. 471. St. Joseph, mindful of the majesty of his heavenly spouse, which it seemed to him she was forgetting in her ardent longing for humiliation, besought her not to deprive him of, his, of this work, which he considered as his alone, as he hastened to set about cleaning the floor and the corners of the cave, although the humble queen continued to assist him therein. As the holy angels were then present in visible form, they were, according to our mode of speaking, abashed at such eagerness for humiliation, and they speedily emulated with each other to join in this work, or rather, in order to say it more succinctly in the shortest time possible, they had cleansed and set in order that cave, filling it with holy fragrance. St. Joseph started a fire with the material which he had brought for that purpose. As it was very cold, they sat at the fire in order to get warm. They partook of the food which they had brought, and they ate this, their frugal supper with incomparable joy of their souls. The Queen of Heaven was so absorbed and taken up with the thought of the impending mystery of her divine delivery that she would not have partaken of food if she had not been urged thereto by obedience to her spouse. 472. After their supper, 
they gave thanks to the Lord, as was their custom. Having spent a short time in this prayer and conferring about the mysteries of the incarnate word, the most prudent virgin felt the approach of the most blessed birth. She requested her spouse, St. Joseph, to betake himself to rest and sleep as the night was already far advanced. The man of God yielded to the request of his spouse and urged her to do the same. And for this purpose, he arranged and prepared a sort of couch with the articles of wear in their possession, making use of a crib or manger that had been left by the shepherds for their animals. Leaving Most Holy Mary in the portion of the cave thus furnished, St. Joseph retired to a corner of the entrance where he began to pray. He was immediately visited by the Divine Spirit and felt a most sweet and extraordinary influence by which he was wrapped and elevated into an ecstasy. In it was shown him all that passed during that night in this blessed cave, for he did not return to consciousness until his heavenly spouse called him. Such was the sleep which St. Joseph enjoyed in that night, more exalted and blessed than that of Adam in paradise. Genesis chapter 21, verse 2. 473. The queen of all creatures was called from her resting place by a loud voice of the Most High, which strongly and sweetly raised her above all created things and caused her to feel new effects of divine power. For this was one of the most singular and admirable ecstasies of her most holy life. Immediately also she was filled with new enlightenment and divine influences, such as I have described in other places, until she reached the clear vision of the divinity. The veil fell, and she saw intuitively the Godhead itself in such glory and plenitude of insight as all the capacity of men and angels could not describe or fully understand. All the knowledge of the divinity and humanity of her most holy Son, which she had ever received in former visions, was renewed, and moreover, other secrets of the inexhaustible archives of the bosom of God were revealed to her. I have not ideas or words sufficient and adequate for expressing what I have been allowed to see of these sacraments by the divine light, and their abundance and multiplicity convince me of the poverty and want of proper expression in created language. 474. The Most High announced to his virgin mother that the time of his coming into the world had arrived, and what would be the manner in which this was now to be fulfilled and executed. The most prudent lady perceived in this vision the purpose and exalted scope of these wonderful mysteries and sacraments, as well in so far as related to the Lord himself, as also in so far as they concerned creatures, for whose benefit they had been primarily decreed. She prostrated herself before the throne of his divinity and gave him glory, magnificence, thanks, and praise for herself and for all creatures, such as was befitting the ineffable mercy and condescension of his divine love. At the same time she was asked, at the same time she asked of the divine majesty new light and grace, in order to be able worthily to undertake the service and worship and the rearing up of the word made flesh, whom she was to bear in her arms and nourish with her virginal milk. This petition the Heavenly Mother brought forward with the prof profoundest humility as one who understood the greatness of this new sacrament. She held herself unworthy of the office of rearing up and conversing as a mother with a God incarnate of which even the highest seraphim are incapable. Prudently and humbly did the mother of wisdom ponder and weigh this matter. And because she humbled herself to the dust and acknowledged her nothingness in the presence of the Almighty, therefore his majesty raised her up and confirmed her anew upon her the title of Mother of God. He commanded her to exercise this office and ministry of a legitimate and true mother of himself, that she should treat him as the son of the Eternal Father, and at the same time the son of her womb. All this could be easily entrusted to such a mother, in whom was contained an excellence that words cannot express. 475. The Most Holy Mary remained in this ecstasy and beatific vision for over an hour, immediately preceding her divine delivery. At the moment when she issued from it and regained the use of her senses, she felt and saw that the body of the infant God began to move in her virginal womb. How, releasing and freeing himself from the place which in the course of nature he had occupied for nine months, he now prepared to issue forth from that sacred bridal chamber. This movement not only did not cause any pain or hardship as happens with the other daughters of Adam and Eve in their childbirths, 
but filled her with incomparable joy and delight, causing in her soul and in her virginal body such exalted and divine effects that they exceed all thoughts of men. Her body became so spiritualized with the beauty of heaven that she seemed no more a human and earthly creature. Her countenance emitted rays of light like a sun incarnadined and shone in indescribable earnestness and majesty, all inflamed with fervent love. She was kneeling in the manger, her eyes raised to heaven, her hands joined and folded at her, at her breast, her soul wrapped in the divinity, and she herself was entirely deified. In this position and at the end of the heavenly rapture, the most exalted lady gave to the world the only begotten of the Father and her own, our Savior Jesus, true God and man, at the hour of midnight, on a Sunday, in the year of the creation of the world, 5,199, which is the, gate, the date given in the Roman Church, and which date has been manifested to me as the true and certain one. 476. There are other wonderful circumstances and particulars which all the faithful assume to have miraculously accompanied this most divine birth. But as the only witnesses were the Queen of Heaven and her courtiers, they cannot all be certified, except only those which the Lord himself manifests in his holy church, to all or to some particular souls in diverse ways. As I think there is some divergence of opinion in this matter, which is most sublime and venerable, as soon as I had manifested to my superiors and directors what had been made known to me, they commanded me under obedience to consult anew the divine oracle and to ask the Empress of Heaven, my mother and teacher, and the holy angels that attend on me for information on some particulars necessary for a clearer statement of the most sacred parturition of Mary, the mother of Jesus, our Redeemer. In order to comply with this command, I returned for a better understanding of these same happenings, and it was then expounded to me in the following manner. 477. At the end of the beatific rapture and vision of the mother ever virgin, which I have described above, number 473, was born the son of justice, the only begotten of the eternal father and of Mary most pure, beautiful, refulgent and immaculate, leaving her untouched in her virginal integrity and purity and making her more godlike and forever sacred. For he did not divide, but penetrated the virginal chamber as the, uh, as the rays of the sun penetrate the crystal shrine, lighting it up in prismatic beauty. Before I describe the miraculous manner in which this took place, I wish to say that the divine child was born pure and disengaged without the protective shield called secundina, surrounded by which other children are commonly born and in which they are enveloped in the wombs of their mothers. I will not detain myself in explaining the cause and origin of the error which is contrary to this statement. It is enough to know and suppose that, the, that in the generation and birth of the incarnate word, the arm of the Almighty selected and made use of all that substantially and unavoidably belong to natural human generation, so that the Word could truly call himself conceived and engendered as a true man, and born of the substance of his mother ever virgin. In regard to the other circumstances which are not essential but accidental to generation and nativity, we must disconnect our ideas of Christ our Lord and of the Most Holy Mary, not only from all that are in any way related or consequent upon any sin, origin, or actual, but also from many others which are not necessary for the essential reality of the generation or birth, and which imply some impurity or superfluity that could in any way lessen or impair the dignity of Mary as the Queen of Heaven, and as true Mother of Christ our Lord. For many such imperfections of sin or nature were not necessary, either for the true humanity of Christ, or for his office of Redeemer or Teacher, and whatever was not necessary for these three ends, and whatever, whatever by its absence would redound to the greater dignity of Christ and his mother, must be denied of both. Nor must be, we be ungenerous in presuming wonderful intervention of the author of nature and grace in favor of her who was his worthy mother, prepared, adorned, and made increasingly beautiful for this purpose. For the divine right hand enriched her at all times with gifts and graces, and reach the utmost limits of his omnipotence possible in regard to a mere creature. 
478. In accordance with this truth, her true motherhood was not impaired by her remaining a virgin in his conception and birth through operation of the Holy Ghost. Although she could have lost her virginity in a natural manner without incurring any fault, yet in that case the mother of God would also be without this singular prerogative of virginity. Therefore we must say, in order that she might not be without it, the divine power of our most holy Son preserved it for her. Likewise, the divine child could have been born with this covering or cuticle in which others are born, yet this was not necessary in order to be born a natural son of the Blessed Mother. Hence, we could not choose, hence he could choose not to take it forth with him from the virginal and maternal womb, just as he chose not to pray to nature not to pay to nature other penal tri tributes of impurity, which other human beings pay, do pay at their coming into the light. It was not just that the incarnate word should be subject to all the laws of the sons of Adam, but it was consequent upon his mirac miraculous birth that he be exempt and free from all that could be caused by the corruption or uncleanness of matter. Thus, also, this covering or secundina was not to fall a prey to corruption outside of the virginal womb, because it had been so closely connected and attached to his most holy body, and because it was composed of the blood and substance of his mother. In like manner, it was not advisable to keep and preserve it outside of her, nor was it becoming to give it the same privilege and importance as to his divine body in coming forth from the body of his most holy mother, as I will yet explain. The wonder which would have to be brought to dispose of that sacred covering outside of the womb would be wrought much more appropriately within. 479. The infant God therefore was brought forth from the virginal chamber unencumbered by any corporeal or material substance foreign to himself, but he came forth glorious and transfigured for the divine and infinite wisdom decreed and, orta and ordained that the glory of his most holy soul should in his birth overflow and communicate itself to his body, participating in the gifts of glory in the same way as happened afterwards in his transfiguration on Mount Tabor in the presence of the apostles. Matthew chapter 17, verse 2. This miracle was not necessary in order to penetrate the virginal enclosure and to leave unimpaired the virginal integrity. For without this transfiguration, God could have brought this about by other miracles. Thus say the holy doctors who see no other miracle in this birth than that the child was born without impairing the virginity of the mother. It was the will of God that the most blessed virgin should look upon the body of her son, the God-man, for this first time in a glorified state for two reasons. One, the one was in order that by this divine vision the most prudent mother should conceive the highest reverence for the majesty of him who she was to treat as her son, the true God-man. Although she was already informed of his twofold nature, the Lord nevertheless ordained that by ocular demonstration she be filled with new graces corresponding to the greatness of her most holy son, which was thus manifested to her in a visible manner. The second reason was to reward by this wonder the fidelity and holiness of the Divine Mother, for her most pure and chaste eyes that had turned away from all earthly things for love of her most holy Son were to see him at his very birth in this glory and thus be rejoiced and rewarded for her loyalty and beautiful love. 480. The sacred evangelist Luke tells us that the mother virgin, having brought forth her first begotten son, wrapped him in swathing clothes and placed him in a manger. He does not say that she received him in her arms from her virginal womb, for this did not part pertain to the purpose of his narrative. But the two sovereign princes, St. Michael and St. Gabriel, were the assistants of the virgin on this occasion. They stood by at proper distance in human corporeal forms at the moment when the incarnate word, penetrating the virginal chamber by divine power, issued forth to the light, and they received him in their hands, with ineffable reference, in the same manner as a priest exhibits the sacred host to the people for adoration, so these two celestial ministers presented to the Divine Mother her glorious and refulgent Son. All this happened in a short space of time. In the same moment in which the holy angels thus presented the Divine Child to his Mother, 
Both son and mother looked upon each other, and in this look she wounded with love the sweet infant and was at the same time exalted and transformed in him. From the arms of the holy princes, the prince of all the heavens spoke to his holy mother, Mother, become like unto me, since on this day for the human existence which thou hast today given me, I will give thee another more exalted existence in grace, assimilating thy existence as a mere creature to the likeness of me, who am God and man. The most prudent mother answered, Trahe me post te curremus inodorem unguentorum tuorum. Canto chapter 1 verse 3. Raise me, elevate me, Lord, and I will run after thee in the order of thy ointments. In the same way, many of the hidden mysteries of the canticles were fulfilled, and other sayings which passed between the infant God and the Virgin Mother had been recorded in that book of songs, as, for instance, My beloved to me, and I to him, and his desire is toward me. Canticle chapter 2, verse 16. Behold, thou art beautiful, my friend, and thy eyes are dove's eyes. Behold, my beloved, for thou art beautiful. And many other sacramental words which to mention would unduly prolong this chapter. 481. The words which Most Holy Mary heard from the mouth of her Most Holy Son served to make her understand at the same time the interior acts of his holiest soul united with the divinity, in order that by imitating them she might become like unto him. This was one of the greatest blessings which the most faithful and fortunate mother received at the hands of her son, the true God and man not only because it was continued from that day on through all her life, but because it furnished her the means of copying his own divine life as faithfully as was possible to a mere creature. At the same time, the heavenly lady perceived and felt the presence of the most holy trinity, and she heard the voice of the eternal father saying, This is my beloved son, in whom I am greatly pleased and delighted. Matthew chapter 17 verse 5. The most prudent mother, made entirely godlike in the overflow of so many sacraments, answered, Eternal Father and exalted God, Lord and Creator of the universe, give me anew my, thy permission and benediction to receive in my arms the desired of nations. A.G.G. Chapter 2, verse 8. And teach me to fulfill as thy unworthy mother and lowly slave thy holy will. Immediately she heard a voice which said, Receive thy only begotten Son. Imitate him, and rear him, and remember that thou must sacrifice him when I shall demand it of, him, of thee. The Divine Mother answered, Behold the creature of thy hands. Adorn me with thy grace, so that thy Son and my God receive me for his slave. And if thou wilt come to my aid with thy omnipotence, I shall be faithful in his service. And do thou count it no presumption in thy insignificant creature that she bear in her arms and nourish at her breast, her own Lord and Creator. 482. After this interchange of words so full of mysteries, the divine child suspended the miracle of his transfiguration, or rather, he inaugurated the other miracle, that of suspending the effects of glory in his most holy body, confining them solely to his soul. And he now assumed the appearance of one, in, of one capable of suffering. In this form, the most pure mother now saw him and still remaining in a kneeling position and adoring him with profound humility and reverence, she received him in her arms from the hands of the holy angels. And when she saw him in her arms, she spoke to him and said, My sweetest love and light of my eyes and being of my soul, thou hast arrived in good hour into this world as the son of justice, Malachi chapter 4 verse 2, in order to disperse the darkness of sin and death. True God of the true God, Save thy servants and let all flesh see him, who shall draw upon it salvation. Isaiah chapter 9 verse 2. Receive me, thy servant, as thy slave, and supply my deficiency, in order that I may properly serve thee. Make me, my son, such as thou desirest me to be in thy service. Then the most prudent mother turned toward the eternal father to offer up to him his only begotten, saying, Exalted creator of all the universe, here is the altar and the sacrifice acceptable in thy eyes. Malachi chapter 3 verse 4. From this hour on, O Lord, look upon the human race with mercy, and inasmuch as we have deserved thy anger, it is now time that thou be appeased in thy son and mine. Let thy justice now come to rest, and let thy mercy be exalted. 
For on this account, the word has clothed itself in the semblance of sinful flesh. Romans chapter 8, verse 3. And became a brother of mortals and sinners. Philip chapter 2, verse 7. In this title, I recognize them as brothers, and I intercede for them from my inmost soul. Thou, Lord, has made me the mother of thy only begotten without my merit, since this dignity is above all merit of a creature. But I partly owe to men the occasion of this incomparable good fortune, since it is now on their account that I am the mother of the word made man and redeemer of them all. I will not deny them my love or remit my care and watchfulness for their salvation. Receive, eternal God, my wishes and petitions for that which is according to thy pleasure and good will. 483. The Mother of Mercy turned also toward all mortals and addressed them, saying, Be consoled, ye afflicted, and rejoice, ye disconsolate. Be raised up, ye fallen. Come to rest, ye uneasy. Let the just be gladdened, and the saints be rejoiced. Let the heavenly spirits break out in new jubilee. Let the prophets and patriarchs of limbo draw new hope, and let all the generations praise and magnify the Lord, who renews his wonders. Come, come, ye poor. Approach ye, little ones, without fear, for in my arms I bear the lion made a lamb, the Almighty become weak, the invincible subdued, come to draw life, hasten to obtain salvation, approach to gain eternal rest, since I have all this for all, and it will be given to you freely and com communicated to you without envy. Do not be slow and heavy of heart, ye sons of men, and thou, O sweetest joy of my soul, Give me permission to receive from thee that kiss desired by all creatures. Therewith, the most blessed mother applied her most chaste and heavenly lips in order to receive the loving caresses of the divine child, who on his part, as her true son, had desired them from her. 484. Holding him in her arms, she thus serves as the altar and the sanctuary where the 10,000 angels adored in visible human forms their creator incarnate. And as the most blessed Trinity assisted in an especial manner at the birth of the word, heaven was as it were, as it were emptied of its inhabitants, for the whole heavenly court had betaken itself to that blessed cave of Bethlehem and was adoring the creator in his garb and habit of a pilgrim. Phil chapter 2 verse 7. And in their concert of praise, the holy angels intoned the new canticle, Gloria in excelsis Deo, et in terra pax omnibus bone voluntatis, Luke chapter 2, verse 14. In sweetest and sonorous harmony, they repeated it. It, it doesn't say the translation. The translation is glory on earth, Glory to God and peace on earth to men of good will. That's what that means. Gloria in excelsis Deo et in terra pax omnibus bone voluntatis. A frequently misquoted Bible verse. Peace on earth to men of good will, not peace on, our, on earth, good will to man. That's not the way to properly translate that verse. In sweetest and sonorous harmony, they repeated it, transfixed in wonder at the new miracles then being fulfilled and at the unspeakable prudence, grace, humility, and beauty of that tender maiden of 15 years who had become the worthy trustee and minister of such vast and magnificent sacraments. 485. It was now time to call St. Joseph, the faithful spouse of the most discreet and attentive lady, as I have said above, number 472. He was wrapped in ecstasy in which he was informed by divine revelation of all the mysteries of the sacred birth during this night. But it was becoming that he should see and before all other mortals should in his corporal, corporeal faculties and senses be present and experience, adore and reverence the word made flesh. For he of all others had been chosen to act as the faithful warden of this great sacrament. At the desire of his heavenly spouse, he issued from his ecstasy, and on being restored to consciousness, the first sight of his eyes was the divine child in the arms of the Virgin Mother, reclining against her sacred countenance and breast. There he adored him in profoundest humility, 
and in tears of joy, he kissed his feet in great joy and admiration, which no doubt would have taken away and destroyed life in him if divine power had not preserved it, and he certainly would have lost all the use of his senses if the occasion had permitted. When St. Joseph had begun to adore the child, the most prudent mother asked leave to her, of her son to arise, for until then she had remained on her knees. And while St. Joseph handed her the wrappings and swaddling clothes which she had brought, she clothed him with incomparable reverence, devotion, and tenderness. Having thus swathed and clothed him, his mother, with heavenly wisdom, laid him in the crib, as related by St. Luke, Luke chapter 2, verse 7. For this purpose she had arranged some straw and hay upon a stone in order to prepare for the God-man his first resting place upon earth, next to that which he had found in her arms. According to divine ordainment, an ox from the neighboring fields ran up in great haste, and entering the cave, joined the beast of burden brought by the queen. The Blessed Mother commanded them, with what show of reverence was possible to them, to acknowledge and adore, and adore their Creator. The humble animals obeyed their mistress and prostrated themselves before the child, warming him with their breath and rendering him the service refused by men. And thus... The God-made man was placed between two animals, wrapped in swaddling clothes and wonderfully fulfilling the prophecy that the ox knoweth his owner and the ass his master's crib. But Israel hath not known me, and my people hath not understood. Wow. Teaching of the Most Holy Queen Mary. 486. My daughter, if men would keep their heart disengaged, and if they would rightly and worthily consider this great sacrament of the kindness of the Most High towards men, it would be a powerful means of conducting them in the pathway of life and subjecting them to the love of their Creator and Redeemer. For as men are capable of reasoning, if they would only make use of their freedom to treat this sacrament with the reverence due to its greatness, who would be so hardened as not to be moved to tenderness at the sight of their God, become man, humiliated in poverty, despised, unknown, entering the world in a cave, lying in a manger, surrounded by brute animals, protected only by a poverty-stricken mother and cast off by the foolish arrogance of the world. Who will dare to love the vanity and pride which was openly abhorred and condemned by the Creator of heaven and earth in his conduct? No one can despise the humility, poverty, and indigence which the Lord loved and chose for himself, as the very means of teaching the way of eternal life. Few there are who stop to consider this truth and example, and on account of this vile ingratitude, only the few will reap the fruit of these great sacraments. 487. But if the condescension of my most holy Son was so great as to bestow so liberally upon thee his light and knowledge concerning these vast blessings, ponder well how much thou art bound to cooperate with this light, in order that thou mayest correspond to this obligation. I remind and exhort thee to forget all that is of earth, and lose it out of thy sight, that thou seek nothing, or engage thyself with nothing, except what can help thee to withdraw and detach thee from the world and its inhabitants, so that with a heart freed from all terrestrial affection, thou dispose thyself to celebrate in it the mysteries of the poverty, humility, and divine love of the incarnate God. Learn from my example the reverence, fear, and respect with which thou must treat him, remembering how I acted when I held him in my arms. Follow my example whenever thou receivest him in thy heart in the venerable sacrament of the Holy Eucharist, wherein is contained the same God-man who was born of my womb. In his holy sacrament thou receivest him and possessest him, possessest him just as really, and he remains in thee just as actually as I possessed him, and conversed with him, although in another manner. 488. I desire that thou go even to extremes in this holy reverence and fear, and I wish that thou take notice and be convinced that in entering into thy heart, in the holy sacrament, thy God exhorts thee in the same words which thou hast, re hast recorded as spoken to me, become like unto me. His coming down from heaven onto the earth his being born in humility and poverty, his living and dying in it, giving such rare example of the contempt of the world and its deceits. The knowledge which thou hast received concerning his conduct 
in which thou hast penetrated so deeply by divine intelligence, all these things should be for thee like living voices, which thou must heed and inscribe into the interior of thy heart. These privileges have all been granted to thee in order that thou discreetly use the common blessings to their fullest extent, and in order that thou mayest understand how thankful thou must be to my most holy Son and Lord, and how shouldst stri and how thou shouldst strive to make as great a return for his goodness as if he had come from heaven to redeem thee alone, and as if he had instituted all his wonders and doctrines in the Holy Church for none else than thee. Galatians chapter 7, verse 20.